Um, next, we're going to jump into our, our COVID update. And I'm going to pass it off to, I think, Kip, who will start us off. And we've got four distinct uh, presentations today. Kip. Thank you, Dave. And congratulations, Carolina. Honored to be uh, continuing to work with you and, and your tremendous leadership on communications. Um, I am Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager, and along with Lee Wilcox, serve as the Director of the Emergency Operations Center. So on behalf of all of the employees and our nonprofit partners in the EOC and across the city responding to COVID-19, I'd like to take some time to update you on our response and key events over the last month's, month since we last spoke to you. It's now been 354 days since we initiated our pandemic response team in the city of San Jose. And in that time here in the United States, we have lost over 372,000 lives and people to this disease, including an all too painful 919 deaths locally with about 700 patients currently struggling with COVID-19 in local hospitals, along with continued high unemployment and economic distress all of which disproportionately impact our Black, Latinx, and Native American individuals and communities, not only across the nation, but also here in San Jose. I have to say these, these numbers are really are staggering and defy comprehension. Each person sick is a person uh, and their family who's suffering. Each death is a tragedy into itself. And we have had days now, like last Friday, with over 4,000 deaths in a single day and are seeing daily new case numbers at the state level in California at a rate we used to see nationally and consider too high. So we begin this presentation today knowing we are in the darkest of days and with compassion for all of those who are suffering as a result of this pandemic. We'll begin, uh, next slide. We'll begin with a look at a data dashboard that's provided by the Johns Hopkins University that gives us daily updates and gives us a sense of comparisons across the nation and indeed across the globe. So if Elizabeth, you go ahead and play that video, we'll take a look at that for about one minute exactly. So the only thing I have to add to that is the unfortunate note that the Monday and Tuesday numbers tend to be lower than the seven day running average because of the way reporting is done. So that 1,700 death total you saw for today is not an indication of decline, but just an indication of how the reporting happens. And in fact, as you can see from this slide, we are still in the very biggest wave of COVID yet. The data that you're seeing is from a pilot that we are running with the Center of Disease Control and Stanford University in collaboration with Santa Clara County. And it looks at wastewater effluent, and which covers about 80% of the city and uses a number of techniques to estimate the prevalence of the virus within the community. This wastewater surveillance technique is very useful for us because it provides a forward looking understanding of what is likely to happen. The virus shows up in the wastewater when people are asymptomatic um, or even if they never become symptomatic. It also shows up whether or not they get tested. So we found that this gives us a kind of six to seven day lead on what we see in the testing numbers. What you see here is that the issuance of the stay at home order has yet to bring us down from a peak. And in fact, we have risen significantly since the issuance of the stay at home order. So this continues to grow locally in a very severe way. Next slide. 
The other slide that I'll share from the county is this one on ICU capacity. I, I found this particular slide very useful because what they've done here is they've done a red line across the top, which is their normal ICU capacity. Because the uh, percentage of ICU beds available is a little bit deceptive in that they have been working extremely hard to make uh, ICU capacity available and surging the number of beds. But I think this diagram shows you what's happening in a way that's painfully clear. You see the orange uh, part on the bottom is the number of COVID or, or suspected COVID patients that are part of the ICU. And what you see is that has been steadily rising. You see that the blue number is the normal number of ICU patients. You see that that has been getting smaller. This does not mean that less people are having these different accidents or these different conditions. It's that they are rationing or allowing less of those folks into the ICU and managing the ICU capacity as best they can to preserve that capacity. Um, we're really fortunate that we have a, a strong healthcare system locally and the county leadership on marshalling both the private and their own resources to provide for this healthcare capacity, but they are in a very, very difficult time right now. Um, we have a seven day rolling average of 1,250 new cases. We saw on January 10th, 1,551 new cases and 36 deaths in a single day. And uh, this is really, again, the darkest and hardest part of this pandemic, not only locally, but nationally. And that fact that it's national and not just local differentiates it from previous surges and makes it even more difficult. Because if a surge is localized, you can always draw resources for healthcare or other things from other parts of the country. But since this is a national surge, we are limited in what we can draw on mutual aid for everything from healthcare to vaccinations to other needs. So the next slide you see here is just a summation and a reminder that we continue to be under a regional stay at home order. This order is now in effect indefinitely and will only be reversed when we get that ICU uh, and healthcare situation under control, which is not any time in the foreseeable next few weeks. So we expect to stay in this regional stay at home order for the foreseeable future at this point in time. Um, on the city side, our own internal planning has a 10 stage uh, process. Stages one through five ramp us up in response and stages six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 intended to ramp us back down into the new normal. We had gotten as far over to the right in st as stage eight, but then with the latest surge have moved progressively backwards. And on December 6, in sync with the regional stay at home order, we moved back into stage five, which is our highest level of response and our most restricted level of service provision. We are currently in stage five and it will, we will stay in stage five as long as the regional stay at home order is in, a pl in place. I would say the only thing that's a positive about going back into stage five is we know much more about both the disease at this point and how to safely operate in the context of this pandemic. So we have a broader range of services opening and functioning in this version of stage five than we did the last time around. No, nevertheless, it is our most restrictive and highest alert stage. Next slide. I want to talk just a little bit about vaccinations, and that is the one light of hope in this dark winter, is the existence now of effective vaccinations that have begun to be distributed and to make their way into people's arms. We are fully supportive of the county's leadership in this role in vaccine distribution here in the city EOC. And to support the county, we have spun up an internal vaccination task force within the EOC structure, which started work mid-December as the vaccinations began to scale. That task force, which is led by Ann Tran, who I'll introduce momentarily, has four work streams. Internal vaccinations, which have uh, largely been led at this point uh, very well by our fire department, and we'll hear more about that soon. Communication and community engagement, which will be one of the main areas of re responsibility we will have, and we'll be engaging deeply with the mayor and council on that topic as we uh, learn and grow that function. Advocacy in alignment with the county at the state and federal level to make sure that we have the resources that we need and the appropriate policies. And then last but not least is a site selection support upon request from the county. And we're currently working through some requests for the county for potential expansions of vaccination sites um, across the city. 
So with that, I want to introduce Ann Tran, who is our director of our internal task force working on this and brings to this position a great deal of uh, professional expertise and training in medicine and, um, and related public health. She also is one of the co-authors of our original pandemic response plan and so has been involved from the 24th of January on deeply in how we think about pandemic and pandemic response. She also happens to be bilingual, bicultural and uh, fluent in native speaker in Vietnamese and understand deeply the immigrant experience, which I think her guiding us has been helpful as we think about that last inch and reaching our most vulnerable. Um, she leads the team of uh, diverse and talented folks and I'll let her speak uh, now with an update on where we think we are with vaccinations and our approach to it. Anne, take it away. Thank you, Kip. Um, good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, and members of the public. Um, my name is Anne, and I currently lead the Vaccination Campaign Task Force here in the EOC. And we're working with leaders within the EOC to support um, the county who is lead in the allocation and distribution of the COVID-19 um, vaccine. I want to take a moment to reiterate um, what Kip has mentioned in a previous council session, which is vaccine allocation and distribution involves federal, state, and local decisions. And at the federal government level, you know, the, the CDC helps develop and approve, um, the CDC and the FDA helps develop and approve vaccines, as well as establish an overall prioritization guideline for, um, for states and local governments to follow. And this federal government also has a role in distributing um, vaccines to federal agencies and, um, and organizations like prisons. And you'll see uh, that at the state level, the state also provides direct allocation to state-run entities and multi-county entities. And at the local level, the county um, is responsible for coordinating uh, the logistics and vaccine storage and administration at the local level, especially through the providers. Um, next slide, please. Can you hang on for just a second? I think we have actually the wrong deck up. So uh, we'll just do a quick swap out of this deck with the correct one. Um, I don't think it substantially changed anything we said, but just wanna make sure we have the latest slides as things are changing extremely rapidly in this area as folks know. So just uh, give us a moment while we uh, swap out the decks. One of the things I did want to add to the, this, the point that Anne was making on that slide is that, you know, we have very strong partners uh, at the county on this. Dr. Finster Scheib, who is leading the vaccination effort, very skilled in this. And one of the things the county has let us know is they have a fairly limited visibility on some of what's happening at the, the state and the county level and are really finding out, for example, day to day, how many doses of vaccines are coming into the county. So there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of things that are being figured out in quick time. And so with that, I think if we could bring up the new slide deck and we'll let Anne continue back on. Just bear with us for just a moment. And why don't you start from your notes on the next slide and then we'll, actually the, actually this next one is pretty complicated and I do want people to see it so let's I'm, I apologize we'll go ahead and keep paused here for a second there's a there's a lot to this next one it's the the federal vaccine schedule which has just apparently changed as of this morning. Um, so um, want to make sure you know what we know and what we don't know about what the vaccination schedule is on where people are and aren't. Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and pull up uh, my deck and share it um, so that we are working from the right deck. Just give me a second to do that and I will bring you right to the point here. All right. Okay, let me get this going and then I'll have to swap a few things here. And let me swap that. There, you should be seeing now, uh, this was the uh, slide. Um, and again, this shows sort of the circle arrow is, is from, this is from the county. It shows there's sort of limited visibility into what's going on at the state and the federal level. So this next slide now, um, and back to you. 
Thanks so much for juggling that, Kith. Um, I want to give you an update on the, uh, the state's updated uh, vaccination guidance. We are in um, phase 1A, which, is, which includes healthcare workers, long-term care residents, and staff and also includes emergency medical services. An update from our fire department, our fire department, um, San Jose Fire Department, emergency medical technicians, EMTs, and paramedics have began receiving um, the COVID-19 vaccinations under the phase 1A group. Currently, the fire department personnel began receiving vaccinations on December 22nd of 2020. And we have 71% um, of sworn fire personnel, including um, EMTs, but not exclusively to EMTs, um, have received the first vaccination dose. And this week, some will be receiving their second dose. On January 2nd, 2021, um, the first responders, uh, a first responder specific clinic was established to accelerate the vaccine delivery. And fire department paramedics from across the county have been uh, supporting this uh, accelerated vaccination effort, including San Jose Fire um, Department. And the overall status of the phase 1A vaccine rollout is that out of a total of um, the county's population of 135 to 140,000 healthcare personnel, um, a total of first doses received for healthcare providers is at 100,280. The county announced 110,000. 110,280. Yeah. Um, the county, thank you, Kip. The county announced on Friday that the healthcare system currently has enough vaccines to administer um, to everyone under phase 1A and the state has granted them approval to start administering um, vaccinations to everyone in phase 1A without distinguishing between tiers one, two, and three within that group. Um, it is also important to note that prioritization guidelines um, are subject to change uh, and can be modified a little bit by the county to meet local needs. Um, the vaccination rollout um, for phase 1B, tier one, will start by the end of the month. That's what we heard from the county. And under phase 1B, tier one, you'll see that seniors, 75 years and older, and workers in education, childcare, and emergency services and food and agriculture are included. However, um, given the news that we received just about 20 minutes ago, that the Trump administration um, would release all vaccine doses and instructed states to immediately start vaccinating Americans 65 years and older, as well as those who have health conditions that put them at greater risk for from dying from the virus. So the, the announcement came from Health Secretary Alex Azar and um, states will lose their allocations if they do not um, use up their doses quickly. So this might impact how vaccinations will be scaling out um, at the local level. Next slide. The ESC has been um, invited to attend regular working group sessions with the county. In this case, it is the COVID-19 Community Stakeholder Working Group with the goal of helping to identify racial and health equity criteria for vaccine planning, co-develop um, messaging unique to specific groups, and share vaccine-specific information to allow people to make informed decisions about the COVID-19 vaccine. We also have the opportunity to meet with public health leaders for working group planning and lead sector-specific breakout groups and subcommittee uh, meetings. The county affirms that we are still in the early stages of um, mass vaccine distribution to the general public, so we here in the EOC will ensure to inform council and leadership as new developments related to the vaccine arise. Our next stakeholder working group meeting is scheduled for January 25th, 2021, with different um, sub-working group meetings happening between now and then. Next slide. In addition to contributing to the county's vaccine stakeholder working group, the city is also supporting the county's community ambassadors program with a goal to inform, engage, and vaccinate our community. You'll see that many community stakeholders participate in both programs, including the city of San Jose as a local agency. You'll, the city um, helped identify 
583 and counting um, contacts from nonprofits, business associations, municipal and neighborhood associations. And we've identified over 100 community influencers to support us with targeted communications to our diverse communities. We look forward to augmenting the county's efforts to correct misinformation and allay concerns um, regarding the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine, as well as share lo logistical information related to vaccine rollout and directly reach our un underserved communities. Um, we are prepared to do this by utilizing different tactics such as social media outreach, influencer videos, leveraging our nonprofit community leaders and city employee networks, and door-to-door -door canvassing. We also will work to distribute information and communication toolkits through all possible channels, including the San Jose Ambassadors Network um, as we've received them. So with that, thank you for your time. And I wanna hand this back over to Kip to move us along. Thank you, Anne. We really do think that this Ambassadors Network is gonna be key over the next 120 days as we work uh, from the logistics trail responsible for that last mile to that important last inch of vaccinations. And I know that many of you on the council have been involved with the ambassadors group. I know there's some great trainings that have been conducted as well, and we'll continue to uh, really work in tight coordination with the county on rolling out an effective campaign to not only get the message out, but to get those, those shots to the last inch. So on the broader EOC side, the, our roadmap through the epidemic continues to guide our work. And over the past month, since our last COVID-19 update to the city council, here are a few highlights that I wanna share from that roadmap team. We've reviewed and updated codes of safe practice in light of the stay at home order for key city services to ensure employee safety. We've supported our most vulnerable residents and businesses by conducting a rapid appraisal of food, sheltering and small businesses needs and been responsive to the needs identified. We've increased communication with the public and our staff with an emphasis on clear messaging of the recent orders and services available to help through this difficult time in multiple languages in order to reach all of our community partnered with the county to understand our role in compliance, ensured all of our core inventories of personal protective equipment and gear are at a 30, excuse me, a 90 day supply or better, um, continued our effort at housing and sheltering our unsheltered, including opening up uh, and working to open up additional emergency housing sites. You'll hear more about support for small business and additional efforts around food over the winter break uh, a little bit later in this presentation. So, um, I'd like to now shift over to a deep dive into the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplement Appropriations Act of 2021. And here to take us through what that means at a higher level is Bena Chang, who has been our lead of intergovernment relations and really uh, revitalized our, our work and function in that area, as well as then Andrea Flores Shelton, who leads the EOC's Task Force on Community and Economic Recovery. And we'll talk in a little bit more detail about what that means for San Jose small businesses at this phase of our recovery. So Benna, go ahead and take it away. Great, thanks Kip. Good afternoon, Council. Benna Chang, the city's director of intergovernmental relations. As we all know, the political landscape in DC has changed a lot since we last reported to council, with the Senate going to a 50-50 Democrat-Republican split. This will make it easier for President-elect Biden to move his ambitious agenda forward. However, our lobbyists note that the margins are razor thin in both the House and the Senate, and any legislation will require negotiation and compromise with both moderate Democrats and with Republicans. We'll come back to Council in the future to talk about how this landscape changes our federal agenda, but for today, we wanted to brief Council on the stimulus and omnibus bill that Congress passed and the President signed during the lame duck session. H.R. 133 is a $2.3 trillion package that combines both a coronavirus stimulus bill with annual appropriations and water and energy bills. We've listed on the slide some highlights of what the bill funds in terms of the city's COVID response priorities, including food, childcare, broadband, and small business assistance. While funding from these programs will not come directly to the city, they will go out to our partners and to the community directly, and will in turn hopefully reduce demand on city services. Next slide, please. While the final package did not include additional direct local flexible funding, like the coronavirus relief funds that we received in the CARES Act, it does anticipate receiving direct funding through two programs in this package. First is the Treasury Department's new Emergency Rental Assistance Program and the Airport Coronavirus Response Grant Program. I should also note that HR 133 
provides an extension to spend our coronavirus relief funds from the CARES Act. The new deadline to spend those funds is December 31st of 2021. Next slide. We want to spend a little bit more time today talking about the new Treasury Department's Emergency Rental Assistance Program. This new program directs funding to states and jurisdictions with more than 200,000 in population. The Treasury Department will be releasing final figures in a few weeks, but we have seen estimates from the Congressional Research Service that shows San Jose's share of the program will be roughly 30 million. I also note that the state and the county will be receiving additional funding as well. Uh, the county share is estimated at $27 million. So roughly $57 million will be coming to the region through this program. The funds are available to spend until December 31st of 2021. And the Treasury Department is authorized to take back any unobligated funds no sooner than September of 2021. So they can redistribute funding to jurisdictions. And the administrative costs for this program are capped at 10% of the award. Next slide. So the legislation sets some parameters for the program, although we expect to see additional guidance come out from the Treasury Department to clarify the program and reporting requirements. The legislation says that the funds can be used for both back rent and forward rent, as well as utilities and other housing expenses. We can provide assistance for 12 months with an ability to extend for another three months if the city so chooses. Before we pay for any forward rent, uh, we are required to assist with any back rent owed and payment of forward rent is restricted to three months. After those three months, house schools can reapply to the program. Finally, the leg legislation allows the city to pay the landlord or utility directly. Next slide. So who qualifies for, for this program? Households that qualify for unemployment or can attest to financial hardship due to the pandemic, demonstrate risk of homelessness, and have a household income below 80% of AMI can qualify for this program. The legislation also asks us to prioritize households below 50% of AMI or those who have been unemployed for 90 days or more. The program is not for people who are receiving other federal housing assistance. On the next steps, I uh, wanted to give you an update that last Friday, the city did submit the required paperwork to the Treasury Department for this program. We anticipate funding will come to the city before January 27th. And as I mentioned earlier, the Treasury Department will confirm the award amounts in about the next two weeks. Um, in a few slides, Andrea will talk more about the city's next steps on implementing this program. Next slide. I finally wanted to provide a quick update on the eviction moratorium status as well. So you might note that HR 133 does include an extension of the CDC uh, federal eviction moratorium to January 31st of 2021. I'll note that the state of California's eviction moratorium is actually more stringent than the federal requirements. And at the state level, as the council knows, Assembly Member Ch David Chu did introduce AB 15 to extend the protections of the state bill from January 31st of 2021 to December 31st of 2021. The city has supported the bill per council direction and legislative program. And we understand that AB 15 is scheduled to have its first hearing this week. It's an urgency bill, so it would take effect as soon as the governor signs it, instead of waiting until January of next year. Last week, the governor indicated his support for extending AB 3088, and uh, I think things would look fairly positive, although we will see how the hearings go this week. If the state does not take action, the housing department is scheduled to come to council on February 2nd for local action. And with that, I'll hand over the presentation to Andrea. Thank you, Benna. Um... Good afternoon, Council, Honorable Mayor. Um, aligned with the community and economic recovery's objectives to invest, empower, and partner, our team is planning, coordinating, and operating the following activities related to the upcoming federal relief package, while also closing out the first tranche of the CARES Act funding for local assistance. So before I discuss the small business work, let me note that our team will administer the rental relief program under Michelle McGurk's leadership. We're putting a team together to deliver on this $30 million program, and we're committing $8.5 million of the $30 million to the county's isolation and quarantine program, specifically related to the rental relief and utility support. So to develop this version of the rental relief program, we are getting input from the community around rental relief needs and assessing all the lessons learned from the previous programs, both through surveys and direct outreach. We're meeting with stakeholders and partners around developing a work plan to deploy the funds quickly 
and effectively, and our program implementation details will be shared with Council at the February 25th study session. Uh, last Friday, January 8th, Council uh, should have received an email toolkit that covered the stimulus payments, food benefits, and eviction moratorium details. Uh, we will augment this with new information received, I believe, yesterday about the new mortgage payment forbearance request program that postpones payments for up to 180 days. We gr greatly appreciate you getting the word out to our constituents and EPIO is updating. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, we have some tutoring going on there. Um, we, uh, we greatly appreciate you getting the word out um, to our constituents and uh, EPIO will be updating the Virtual Local Assistance Center um, with these details. Um, also, in addition to the relief program awareness, we continue to seek information directly from our residents and our small businesses on, the, on an ongoing basis. Again, to inform our strategic decisions um, through um, surveying community needs. So currently we have the community needs survey open, and this is an update to the survey we did in September, and it's a little more extensive. This is currently open and it will close January 22nd. So we have 10 more days and we, would, we do need your help in pushing out this survey. It is available in four languages and was promoted on Vietnamese radio this morning. Next slide. Um, so more specific to the small business relief package, we wanna update you on the pay, uh, Paycheck uh, Protection Program, which is funded at 284 billion. Um, this is extending the PPP through March 31st of 2021. The PPP changes include that it's open to businesses that did receive a, a PPP last year, and there's also a set aside for very small businesses with 10 or fewer employees and for small businesses located in distressed areas. Um, restaurants, hospitality businesses can get bigger awards, three and a half times um, average their total monthly payroll rather than two and a half times. And a, an important element is that it simplifies the forgiveness process for loans of $150,000 and less. Um, this uh, this program is also, um, it, it is open uh, January 13th, tomorrow. In the Economic Injury and Disaster uh, Program, grant program, there's two, 20 billion available and small businesses and nonprofits and low income communities are eligible to receive $10,000 grants. Those same groups that received a EIDL advance grant previously are also eligible to receive the full 10,000 if their award was less than the first round. So again, this is good news for those who participated in the first round or, and are eligible again. Um, finally, grants for shuttered venue operators for our arts and cultural communities. There's 15 billion available um, to live venues, independent movie theaters and cultural institutions, which is great news um, for our community. So to get the word out about these important opportunities, the economic recovery team with EPIO did an incredible amount of work just prior to and through furlough. And we wanna highlight and let you know how we've been getting the word out. There were nine email blasts in the last 30 days, which totaled 235,000 emails. Um, the good news is that we had an open rate of 48%, which is two times the industry standard. We also spread the message through community-based organizations, kind of non-traditional business partners. Uh, we put the business support resource brochure, uh, we produced it and distributed it to over 160 CBOs. Um, last week, OED staff led a webinar on the California Relief Grant Fund. We had over 540 registrations with uh, 344 local attendees. So this California Relief Grant Fund has currently $470 million in it, and the governor um, in his proposed budget includes another $500 million. Um, and those unsuccessful businesses, um, if, if businesses do not get a grant in phase one, they will automatically be entered in phase two. So hoping for some seamlessness for our uh, business community. Um, Finally, new data downloaded from the Small Business Association shows that more businesses in our city received a PPP uh, loan 
um, the first time with over um, 11,000 uh, 11, businesses that received a, under a $150,000 loan and another 2,000 over 150,000. So again, we're getting the word out and it's creating results on the other side. Finally, um, I wanna talk about after the outdoor dining closure order um, in uh, mid-December, the PRNS Alfresco team pivoted to supporting small businesses, um, opening, up their, opening up their businesses to doing more outreach to have them understand what is available to them through uh, the program. There were 720 proactive touches to small businesses um, to get the word out again about loans, grants, and other businesses' supports. Those touches then resulted in 400 inbound calls or emails directly to our helpline um, and emails. So we are getting the word out and we are able to answer questions. Um, everything from more, more requests for information to more complex um, issues related to small business survival needs. And after small business, I do want to circle back um, to the next slide, which is a something that community and economic recovery continues to do. This is a snapshot of our COVID cases by zip code and neighborhood, which um, we're very proud to say our economic recovery will be publishing this on a weekly basis. Um, I shared something similar um, in early uh, December, and unfortunately, our hardest hit neighborhoods remain and the visual doesn't look much different from the last presentation. Um, uh, emphasizing Kip's comments about our current COVID status in our community, um, what we're seeing is almost every zip code has seen a resurgence with more than 7,300 new cases reported in San Jose last week, and an that's an average of 1,052 cases each day. And the total case count in the city zip codes has now reached 53,954. So as we track this by zip code, we wanna just give an example of 95110, which is along the Highway 87 corridor. Uh, we saw a 64% increase in av the average new daily cases from December 31st to today. Um, so again, that resurgence is very real. Um, this information is key to meeting our three strategic objectives, again, of invest, investing, empowering, and partnering, and drives our prioritization process. I really want to thank uh, our assessment team, led by Zach Mendez, with technical expertise of Pablo Hockey, who created this new COVID tracking tool. And again, we will begin to publish this on a weekly basis. So on behalf of Michelle McGurk and Chris Burton, we want to thank the entire community and economic recovery team for the continued push over the holidays and through the next relief package. I'll turn it back to you, Kip. Thank you, Andrea. And, and I, I really want to echo the words of, of, of appreciation to the team. You know, the Congress kept us guessing about what was in, what was out until the very last minute. The president kept us guessing past the last minute. And so what for many people was supposed to be their first break uh, in about a year, uh, jumped back in without so much as a grumble uh, and not only did, did the job of getting the word out, but went above and beyond to make sure that it was done um, in the right languages, in the right cultural context, phone banking, reaching out, always socially distanced and safe, of course, and making sure that our most vulnerable businesses in particular got, got the word about these important programs, some of which are first come, first serve basis. So there was literally no time to lose. Very appreciative, Andrea, of your leadership and, and the leadership of the teams uh, during what was supposed to have been a break for them. Speaking of break, uh, the other thing that doesn't take a break is hunger. So I want to talk a little bit about our food distribution efforts over the, the winter holiday. And for that, I'll introduce uh, two more uh, uh, of our fantastic leadership team. Jill Mariani, um, who some of you know we stole many years ago from Google and has been uh, at the forefront of many of our innovation efforts and is now a wholly owned subsidiary of food and necessities branch, making sure that along with Bill and Beckel that runs and then uh, Amanda Serena, who has given heart and soul to making sure that the policies and approaches that we take around food distribution are actually implemented. They also have a, a partner with us today from Vegolution that I'll let them introduce and we'll close out with this uh, update around our efforts to make sure that people were fed over the winter break. Jill, all yours. 
Thank you, Kip. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the council and members of the public. My name is Jill Mariani, Deputy Director of the Food and Necessities Branch of the Emergency Operations Center. The Food and Necessities Branch was formed in March 2020 in response to Santa Clara County's request for the City of San Jose to take on countywide accountability and joint responsibility for food distribution during the COVID-19 pandemic. All of our work centers around three core objectives, feed our most vulnerable, maximize existing food networks and scale for a widespread food crisis. Through the efforts of our partnerships and staff, we have so far avoided a widespread food crisis within San Jose and more broadly, Santa Clara County. Prior to COVID-19, the city managed about 4,000 meals per week at our senior nutrition sites. Post-COVID, at our peak, we have grown to managing over 3 million meals a week across the county to address food insecurity. I'm joined today with our branch um, distribution operations lead, Amanda Carrera, who will provide an update on our winter holiday meal efforts. Amanda? Thank you, Jill. Um, as Jill mentioned, my name is Amanda Carrera, and I am the distribution operations unit lead for the Food and Necessities Branch for the Emergency Operations Center. Going into the winter holiday, we anticipated that given the shelter in place ordinance and the rising coronavirus cases that we would need to build additional capacity into our pipeline to be able to avoid long lines and food shortages for our most vulnerable populations. We had tapped in <clears throat> to some of that capacity to provide additional meals during the Thanksgiving break and were able to leverage that experience going into the winter holiday, which we knew would be a much longer duration. We were able to provide over 225,000 additional meals to our most vulnerable populations over the winter holiday. These populations included seniors medically at risk, homeless and low income residents by working together with our community partners to provide support additional capacity. These partners that played a critical role in the success of the winter holiday meal effort includes Hunger at Home, Team San Jose, Bateman Trio, the Santa Clara County Office of Education, Revolution Foods, Veggie Lucian, SourceWise, and World Central Kitchen. I would like to hand it over to Emily Schwing, the Marketing and Impact Manager at Veggie Lucian, to shed some more insight into the impacts of the on-the-ground efforts. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Council, Mayor, and staff. My name is Emily Schwing, and I'm the Marketing Impact Manager for Veggie Lucian. Uh, since October 21st, in partnership with Off the Grid, we have been sourcing, packing, and distributing uh, 4,900 grocery boxes weekly for the COVID San Jose Food Relief Program. Through this program, we've established what we consider the beginnings of a true local food hub, which allowed us to expand this program during the holidays these last two months. During November, during the holiday expansion, we were able to add another 1,200 grocery boxes distributed in partnership with Loaves and Fishes and Martha's Kitchen. Then our big push came during the last two weeks of the year when we added an additional 4,800 boxes on top of our regular distri distribution of 9,800 boxes. In total, the November and December holiday expansion, um, holiday expansion work resulted in an additional 6,000 boxes going out to local seniors and families. We wouldn't have been able to do this work without the help of our amazing volunteers and council member Esparza who helped us pack our boxes on one of the busiest days last month. All of our products, produce and grocery items are sourced from local, BIPOC farmers in or near the Santa Clara Valley area. Every morning, our team of volunteers and staff meet these farmers at our packing site at Conservation Court off of Burger Drive to unload and set up for the day. While in conversations with these farmers, we've learned just how much business that they've lost because of COVID. And from a financial perspective, just within this expansion project, we were able to pay these farmers over $123,000. And that's on top of now what is more than a million dollars to local farmers through our work with Off the Grid. For this expansion, we relied heavily on our partners at Loaves and Fishes, Martha's Kitchen, and Hunger at Home for that final step of distributing the boxes to those who need it most in San Jose. We are excited to build our partnership with Off the Grid through March while learning how we can better establish a farm box food hub at Veggie Lucian. Thank you for your time. Emily, thank you so much for your leadership and everything that Veggie Lucian and your partnerships are doing. And thank you, Jill and Amanda, for your relentless uh, effort to make sure that, that we have this broad and deep partnership. So uh, since we've covered everything from vaccinations uh, to, to uh, 
uh, farm boxes. We'll conclude our presentation at this point in time and hand it back to our city manager, Dave Sykes. Thank you, Kip, and thank you, team. Uh, so mayor and council were available for questions.